Welcome back to The In Chamber. I'm your host, Tom Schumann. In our nearly four years of this program, this is our first opportunity to be joined by a former Major League Baseball pitcher. But we're not going to talk baseball. Well, maybe I'll sneak in a question or two about his 15 years on the mound and three world championships. After baseball, our guest went to Wall Street, eventually becoming a co-founder of a private equity fund that owns, manages, and oversees a number of companies. We will definitely touch on that topic. But what we'll focus on, however, is his latest book and some of the lessons to be learned from that. It's titled The Observer, A Modern Fable on Mastering Your Thoughts and Emotions. Todd Stottlemyre, welcome to the In Chamber. Tom, thanks. I really appreciate it. Humbled and honored, grateful to be on the show and hang out with you and have a conversation. Uh, we appreciate that. So, Todd, I'm going to describe uh, kind of a quote here of how your book is described. And it is a motivational self improvement book disguised as a coming of age novel wrapped in a sports story that actually is a fable about pro baseball star Todd Stottlebar's life. There's a lot going on in that sentence there. There is uh, a lot going why on. Why don't, why, don't, why don't we ask you to break it down, talk about it a little bit, and what motivated you to write The Observer? Yeah, what truly motivated me was, if I want to go back to 1993, uh, we just won our second world championship in Toronto. And uh, after living out my childhood dream and, and uh, now playing Major League Baseball, following my father's footsteps, now a two-time world champion, I'm in my 20s, I'm making millions of dollars. Uh, from the outside, I look great. There was a problem. When I looked in the mirror, I, I hated the guy looking back at me. I was on the inside. I was in a very dark place because truly stemmed from a, about 12 years prior to that moment where I gave my little brother, he was 11, I was 15 at the time, gave him a bone marrow transplant. I was the perfect match. It was his third bout on leukemia. Uh, doctors deemed it was his only chance for long-term survival. And and my marrow, my bone marrow, ended up eventually put him into a coma that then eventually took his life. And obviously our family, it was tragic on our family and my mother and father to have to bury their 11 year old son. And I know there's some listeners out there today that have gone through similar tragedies and felt those similar emotions. And it's tough, it's tough on a family, but there were two other emotions I left the hospital with. Number one, anger. I was mad, I was mad at the world. My little brother had been taken away from me and I didn't deem it as fair. The second emotion, which was, you know, really just overtook my body was guilt. I was like, man, it was my marrow that put him into a coma. And, and for a 15 year old boy, even though doctors were telling me, man, it wasn't your fault, my parents, didn't matter what someone told me, it's what I was feeling. And, and I continued to feel and continued to rewrite that story that I had something to do with my little brother's death. And because I did, it really became who I was on the inside. And, you know, after the 1993 World Series, I, I just didn't like the way I was performing on the mound. More importantly, Tom, I didn't like who I was in life. I didn't like my responses, my reactions to situations to when there was a competition or something I couldn't control. It's like all those emotions would come to the present moment and truly ruin the mastery of the moment. So I reached out for help. I wanted help. I needed help. I reached out to a guy by the name of Harvey Dorfman. He was the mindset guru of Major League Baseball. He wrote the mental game of baseball. He was a mindset coach. And, and I booked a meeting with him that was supposed to last two hours, went 12. And we became not only friends, but he worked with me for several years in and there were some critical moments in that 12 hour meeting. I'll just share two real quick with you. Number one was, and he said, Todd, would you do it again? And I said, do what Harvey? And he said, would you give a bone marrow transplant to your little brother again? And I broke down in tears, man. And I was like, you know, and, and I said, I'd do it every minute, every hour, every day. And he says, well, didn't you already do that? And I said, yeah. He says, did you do everything humanly possible you could do? I said, yeah. He said, Todd, you're not God. He said, you didn't kill him and you couldn't save him. You're not in charge and you're not in control of that. You did everything. You, and he was like, he demanded of me to let it go. Once again, I broke and it was liberating because it was like I was carrying this for more than a decade. And the last hour of the meeting, he says, will you do a seven day challenge with me? And I said, yeah. He says, great. Over the next seven days, you're not allowed to respond or react to any stimulus. No response no reaction. He said, you can only document. Here's what I want you to document. I want you to become the observer and observe your thoughts and observe how you feel about the stimulus. And I want you to document it. In seven days, we're going to begin our journey. 
And we're going to build a tool chest for you, principles, real principles, and real models for you to rely on when you start to find yourself getting out of control so that you can not only stay peak performance as a professional, more importantly, you can be a better human being. And I was like all in on it. It was really the making and the beginning of The Observer. I tell people today, I'm 55. That was 1993. I've mastered nothing, just gotten better at all of it. And, and the beauty is, is like something that might have that, that might have carried my emotions and thoughts for a week. It might only be a few moments today because I have a tool chest. I have things that work for me personally. So Todd, you, you mentioned the, 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 the anger and the guilt and certainly how that had stayed with you for over a decade, but now you're on a, you're on what a 27 year journey that continues, right? I mean, that mm-hmm. seems to be the first lesson that there's, mm-hmm. there's it's never too long or never uh, uh, the wrong time to be able to start that journey. That's right. And, uh, you know, there's, I know there's a lot of folks, we look at 2020. And I mean, if we look at what, what happened in this country, as far as race, politics, COVID business, and then look at people, the way we as people reacted to one another based on uh, having different opinions or taking different stances. And, and look at the hate in our responses, look at our knee jerk reactions. And, you know, for me, look, I'm obviously not perfect. Obviously, I still there's still moments in times where I might have a knee jerk reaction, but I go back and I look at it and I say, well, you know, is that who is that reaction? Is that what I believe in? Is that who I am? Is that where I'm going in my journey? And it gives me an opportunity to reflect, go back, look at a past performance, but then create different strategies, different thoughts around it, different emotions around it. Because if I continue to carry that hate and that guilt, it just becomes more and more a part of me all the time. And it blocks, it blocks opportunity. It blocks the opportunity for us to to not only be better, but it blocks opportunities all the opportunities that are staring us in our, in our face that we can't see today is because we got to work from the inside out. And that's where I was. Yeah. Todd, I read the book in one day in, in what really turned out to be two very appropriate kind of time blocks. The first half of the book uh, with setting up the challenge, you know, the, the, the character in the book, and it brought out the story you just told about the bone marrow transplant and some of the other challenges. And then the second half, really almost the solutions and how some of the principles were, were brought back in. Can, can you talk a little more about some of the parallels between the book and your own life, some of those other uh, things that certainly tied together? Yeah, you know, a lot of people that know me um, close or have intimate relationship with that know the story so when they read the book they're like aha I remember when and and I've been asked it's like why didn't you write a memoir and I think the biggest reason there was you know the biggest reason I didn't write a memoir was because in a lot of the stories in the book they do mirror they're not exact you know but they're kind of along the same lines and and the reason I didn't write a memoir is because I wanted the book to be relatable to every person that picked up the book See, I didn't want someone to say, yeah, Todd, that's easy for you. You grew up with, you know, great parents. You grew up, you had a great upbringing, great environment. Um, You stood in the outfield grass next to Mickey Mantle. Sure, you can overcome this, but I don't have that same environment. So I wanted to take any excuses that someone might have because I wanted to, as I was going through the book, I wanted to let people know that no matter my environment, I had pain points. And I had places of darkness and then, and they were ugly times, but, but, and my message really is no matter how dark it is for you today, there's a better way and you can do it too. And I truly 100%, I believe in that. And you're right. The second part of the book started to become the solution. And it's kind of like where I'm at in my life now, as we rebuild this life. Well, there, there's so many principles and strategies in that second half of the book yeah. that, that you have applied. Uh, everything from uh, the 180 degree mindset to getting into the zone, four seasons to a championship. It, take a couple of those that stand out to you. I know there's so many important ones, but a couple maybe most important for a person listening today or even a person in a business type setting. Yeah, I think 180 degree mindset is probably my favorite. And it's really what Harvey taught me back in 1993 is like, if I'm out on a mound or even in life, and if, and if all of a sudden I start losing my emotions, I start responding to a negative to something 
But what am I responding to? I'm responding to something that's already happened. My response is, is the delayed version of what's already happened. Well, what can I do about that. it? So what can I do about it? There's nothing I can do about what's happened. But if, if my mindset, my, my thoughts, and if my emotions are based on what's happened, and then my reaction or response to my new action is based on that, I got a double negative. And Harvey would say, listen, anytime this 180 degree mindset is the opportunity as a human being to observe and be aware, create this awareness, what's going on? What, what thought am I having? If it's a negative thought, take it 180 degrees. It's going to land in positive territory. Begin to focus on the positive territory. You'll start to feel the positive territory and then you can take action. So I love the 180 degree, 80 degree mindset because it meant so much to me in sports. It's meant so much to me in business. And more importantly than both of those, it's meant so much to me in life and becoming the best version of myself. How, I'll, I'll let you get on to another one or two, but how difficult was that challenge he gave you, that seven days of, of no responding, no reacting? And, and, and when he issued that challenge to you, how, how challenging was that? So hard because I'm a competitive guy, right? So when you can't respond, really what he, what he was saying is you're not allowed to compete. You're not allowed to go up against. And because of this, though, um, and we'll talk about the zone because you mentioned it. You know what really happened to me was it created a process for me to really get into the zone because I was truly becoming the observer that week. And, and when you can't respond, you can't react, when you can't take action, guess what happens? You drop your ego because it's no longer about, def you, you're not defending any, anything and, and you're not competing. You're just documenting. And because you're documenting, you now live in the very present moment. It's so important because you're seeing things as they happen and you get to and you get to stand back and say, what do I think about that? What do I feel about that? Let me document these things. And because you're living in that present moment and because you're not defending it and because your ego is not getting in the way and all of these things, you're not wasting time and energy on something you can't control. So it was a funneling to getting into the zone because Harvey used to say, it didn't matter what's already happened. The only thing that matters is what you can control. Focus on what you can control. And it came down to pitch by pitch. And it used to be this pitch, this very moment, what am I going to do with it? Has nothing to do with runners that are first and third and how they got there. Has everything to do. And think about it. We can apply that same principle in life. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can apply all of these principles that was a reflection of my sports career, we can apply them in our business, we can apply them in our life. You, uh, there's a statement at the end of the book that you emphasized and it reads, people can take your, your body, but they can't take your mind unless you give it to them. Expand on that a little bit, if you would, and the importance of that, that mindset. Yeah, so once again, I'll go back to Harvey because you, know, you can tell how, hard, how important Harvey Dorfman was to me in my life. And, and, you know, I would just tell you that, you know, I didn't do any of this alone. I'm not self-made. I've done nothing by myself. It's been always teams, people, coaches, mentors. But Harvey reminded me that day, he said, Todd, just remember something, man. You know, people can throw a rock at you and, and, and or they can, they can punch you. They can stab you. They can shoot you. They can hurt you physically. But the only way they can hurt you mentally, the only way is if you give the power of your mind over to them and respond to negative and, th and situations and things you can't control. So he was always like, man, stand guard of your mind. And he's like, when, you, when you're having emotional, uh, you're having these emotional negative thing, don't show that. And he was kind of a way of like, when I was competing against a team or a batter, don't show them what you're thinking. You know, it was like, stand still, stand tall, stand firm, guard your mind, guard that mind, man. So, so. Yeah, powerful. Todd, when I read that, it reminded me so much of, of Jim Valvano's SB speech, which really was about the same time where he emphasized, you know, in this case, cancer can take your body, but it can't take your mind, your soul and, and all right. that. I, I drew that yeah. parallel. 
It was interesting, I thought. Yeah, well, what an awesome guy he was and so inspirational in his fight, right? And, and uh, you know, just, I mean, he inspired, you know, nations on on what he had done. When we, when we talk about oh, journeys, yeah, know, we talk about journeys like, that's still going on. Yeah. There. It reminds me of my father because my father went through a bout with cancer, 20 years, multiple myeloma, and never let the current circumstances of him fighting for his life destroy the present moment or his future or his vision or what he wanted to accomplish in his life. Well, you gave me a perfect transition there. So your father, Mel, five-time All-Star, five-time World Series champion, pitched 11 years with the Yankees, coach for 23 years. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but talk about your father, his influence and, and how many of these, these strategies and, and, you know, were part of, of his passing on to you. Yeah. Well, obviously he was my greatest coach in life. And, um, for my brothers and I, man, he was our hero. He was our father. He was our best friend. Um, you know, we really truly shared in life together. I mean, he left one hell of a legacy and, and, uh, you know, for me, I love sharing stories about my father because, you know, I get to speak from my heart and I get to share his legacy. But, you know, there was about, uh, I guess it was about 30 to 60 days after his death. And, you know, I was speaking to a group of people and it was my first time kind of being back out in front of people after my father had passed. And it was a very difficult day. And I remember, man, just trying to hold everything together and, and I remember saying that day, because so many people had said so many great things about my father when he passed. And, and whether it was baseball owners, the Steinbrenner family, whether it was the New York Yankees, whether it was teammates, people he played against, coached against, managers, everyone came forward and it was like, and really like, you know, just, just talked about his life and how it impacted them personally. And that day at that and, and on that podium, on that stage in front of that audience where I was struggling, I said, you know, I, I want everyone here to know something. Cause it was important for me is people talked about my father and about how great he was publicly. I said, I want all of you guys to know he was 10 times that person privately. And so many people have a great persona publicly and they turn into monsters privately. My father, my father didn't have any monster, any man. And it was like, it didn't matter. I can't think of one moment in my life that I'd spent with him that after he had left my presence, that I didn't feel better about myself, that I didn't have belief in myself, that he didn't empower me to go and chase my dreams. And it was just incredible. But he was also truly, for my brothers and I, he was our best friend. He was an incredible husband to my mother. You know, and it's like he just left something um, for us to kind of chase and pursue to be the best versions because and, th and then I want to share this It's so important is like I got a chance to be with him the last week of his life. And man, it was emotional. And, and, and uh, we had incredible conversations, even though he couldn't speak. And I was doing all the talking. But at the time, you know, I could just feel the spirit of my father and and, and I'll never forget him taking his last breath where I had my left hand on his heart and my right hand on his head. Whew, man, it's emotional, but you know, I had this sense of gratefulness come over me and I was like, man, my father lived life the right way. He truly didn't have one regret. There wasn't one regret. There wasn't a place he didn't want to go see. There wasn't anything he wanted to accomplish. Like he played the game of life all out. And I just remember in that very moment, I was like, man, this day four, I'm not going to waste one day. I'm going I'm to play this game of life all out and, 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 and give to it what I can and do the best that I can and, and take it from there. So he was, a, he was an incredible example of a man. Well, Todd, thanks for sharing that. And, and, and again, what I just heard was he was teaching you lessons until the very end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I mentioned in the, in the opening your business career. My guess is there's probably not a lot of major leaguers that go from the baseball field to Wall Street, or at least not, you know, maybe that direct route. Talk about that transition for you, how you got started and kind of where you're at in your business dealings. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, my neighbor actually happened to be a director at a local office here in Scottsdale for a for a big Wall Street firm and, and we're having dinner. And he says, what are you gonna do next? I said, I have no idea, man. I'm gonna take some time off. He says, well, why don't you come into my office and meet with me? He says, man, I'd love to have you. And, 
And I loved, I loved the markets. I loved business, but you know, I didn't have any formal education. My, my education was playing major league baseball and growing up in a baseball family. And, but I went in the next day and he said, listen, we love athletes because of how you compete. And I said, and he goes, you'll have a lot to learn. And he says, it'd be like starting in the minor leagues and you just learn and you just learn and learn and learn. So, and it's funny, I left his office with a job that day, not knowing and, and or even thinking about a job at that time and and just dug in and, and, and got started. I ended up building a team. I wanted experts on my team in each of the fields to work with the clients. And, and we began, I began going out there and, and just talking about the guys that I put together and, and the firm and edifying the firm and telling the story. And, and we built this massively successful asset management business. And it was crazy then, like five years into that, we're having all of this success. And, and I woke up one morning and I was like, I think this is it. And I woke my wife up and it was like 3.30 in the morning because I used to get up really early, you know, when I go into the office and I'd say, honey, this is going to be my last day. And she was like, what are you talking about? I go, I just don't see myself working in an office the rest of my life. I said, I'm out. And I went in and talked to the director that day. He thought like, wow, where's he going? And they were trying to make me all kinds of, they made me all kinds of offers. I said, listen, I'm humbled. I'm honored. I'm going to spend the next 30 days helping you guys keep the entire book here, kind of keep the team intact and this and that. I said, but I'm going to venture off, man. I'm going to, life's an adventure. I'm going to go experience new things. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like, I just kept doing different things in business. And, and, and some of them we did great, like working at the Wall Street firm. It was great. Some of them didn't work out so great and turned out to be great le lessons that I could reflect on and build on to help me in my next venture. And, you know, today, man, we got a private equity fund and, and we got about 12 portfolio companies and I work on coaching those executives and, and I'm having the time of my life, I got to tell you. So uh, it's been a great transition. Uh, without, the, without the work that you began in 1993 and, and, you know, all the lessons that you absorbed, could you, without that, could you have even gone in that morning and taken that step and said you were going to venture off on your own? Do you think that would have happened without all the work that you, you put in on your no on I, Tom, I, I i needed to work so much on myself uh not just from a maturity level but you know just you know I, like i say i was so dark on the inside I, I, i'll be honest with you i don't I, I almost think that if i wouldn't have done that work i'm not even sure i'd even we'd be having this conversation i don't even know if i'd be alive today because there were too many times that i would i would get so emotional um, about something that was going on that there were times I would even get to a point where I black out. And then I didn't know what had just happened. And that's scary because, you know, that means you could get into a situation in life and there would be no turning back. And when there's no turning back, you know, sometimes you can, you know, you can, you can walk yourself right off a cliff. So, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. And I, I got to tell you, I look back on it and, you know, I didn't have people telling me, Todd, you need you need help. You know, they just knew me as this fierce competitor that would lay it all on the line. But, you know, like I say, on the inside, I, I needed help. I didn't like who I was. I was struggling with who I was. I was struggling for some of the thoughts and emotions that I had. And, and I was like, man, there's got to be a better way than this. And, and, and I just thank God I look back on that time because it was a whole new direction and trajectory for me. Todd, as you speak with, with, with business owners, entrepreneurs, or others, and share your story and, and you know, share some of these success strategies, what are some of the takeaways you hear? What, what do you hear back from people that, that really strikes them and is, is kind of applies to them in the business world? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I hear from people all the time. They say, man, I, Todd, I didn't, you know, wow, I, I never thought about it that way. You know, one of the things I like to share with business owners is ask a lot of questions. You know, if we'll ask questions and, and if we question ourselves and we'll ask questions to ourselves, we'll come up with answers. And, you know, one of the things like for an example, you know, I talk to a lot of business owners and I say, hey, man, before you get to work, how much work have you done on you to prepare yourself to be the leader you need to be when you get to work? And, 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 and I go, look, the first, the first person you need to lead is not your team, it's yourself. That means we got to work on us. And, and to be a great leader, you got to first lead yourself and, and you got to be an example for everyone else on the team. 
Um, so, you know, I love the championship hour and I believe you can do the championship hour and it's really just nothing more than my morning routine. It's the first hour of my day. My, my morning routine today lasts two hours and, and, it, and it's about, you know, my mind and my body and, and prayer and meditation, journaling, listening, capturing new ideas from other people as I listen to podcasts like yourself and, and I can capture new ideas. And I'm like, wow, this is something I can try. And learning becomes exciting. And then I love to close the end of the week is what can I do more of? And I tell every entrepreneur, look at your week, reflect, go back and look at your past performances. There's so much to learn from it. What do I need to do more of to get better? What do I need to do less of? What's, what's clogging the wheel? What I learned this week? To go through a day or a week and not try to capture learning something, man, uh, is like dying on your feet. And then number four is probably the most important is, what is it I'm grateful for? And listen, we had COVID, businesses were shut down. You still had to find a way to be grateful that you were in business. You still had to find a way because if you couldn't, couldn't get to a place of being grateful, then you couldn't find a way to get better to serve your way out of that situation. Man, there's so many things that I think, you know, I thought, I think journaling in, in a sense, whether however you record your own observations, I think it's a lost art. And I think it's something so many people have missed out on uh, that. How, how, if I can ask, how often do you chronicle your thoughts? Is every on, day, every day, yeah. every day. I'm in a journal every day. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes 30. I literally, uh, and it's two times a day. It's in the morning. And then at night, I closed the night because during the day, a lot of stuff happened and a lot of things came at me. And at night, I can say, hey, what I captured today. And then I spend about 15 minutes to 20 minutes in a very quiet place. I have a reading chair and it's the only place I read. I got a special chair and a special place in my house. And it's where I go to get quiet with myself. And I'll sit in my reading chair after I'm done with my reading I'll try to capture something I got during the day, but then I take about 15, 20 minutes in silence. What am I grateful for? And I found myself being grateful for my failures, my setbacks, my stumbles, my embarrassments, my disappointments. And I got to tell you, when you can get that real and that raw with being grateful every day, gratefulness will show its face when you need it the most. Todd, you talked about, uh, you know, the first first half of your baseball career, so very successful, the two world titles, but, but you know, you were, you were having your own internal struggles, and then you made changes, you went on and pitched another nine years or so. How do you look back today on your baseball career? You know, it's so funny, because people ask me all the time, and, and as I share with them the story about meeting with Harvey, and this and that, and and, uh, you know, when, when they look back on my career, they don't really see a difference. They just see this guy that you know, this fierce competitor and played on some winning teams, had great teammates. And I said, you know, you got to take a look at statistically, if you want to really examine something, statistically, if you look at the first half of my career, you know, it was okay. I'm, I, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I was never a star. I, I called myself a blue collar major league pitcher, man. I was going to do the work. I was there until the end, you know, uh, when a manager came out, of, out, out on the mound to take me out of the game, I didn't want to leave the game. I wanted to finish my work. But at the end of the day, if you look statistically, pr me pre-Harvey Dorfman and then post-Harvey Dorfman, statistically, it's night and day difference. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Harvey wasn't the only one. People like Dave Stewart, Dave Duncan, my pitching coach, uh, Tony La Russa, Cito Gaston, there were so many people that had poured into me to, to help me continue to develop, to work towards my potential. Got to ask you a couple of baseball questions. So who, who, was, who were among the most difficult hitters for you to face? That guy or two that you just couldn't seem to get out no matter what you threw up there? Well, this is probably a fan favorite is, and, and I did okay against him, but, um, and this is probably not going to be a fan favorite response, but um, of all the guys I pitched against in my career, Barry Bonds was head and shoulders above all the rest, not some of the rest, all of the rest. He had, he could do things like uh, early in the count, he would stretch the plate, he'd swing at different pitches. As you got Barry with two strikes, he made you throw the ball on the white part of the plate. 
And as long as the umpire was correctly calling balls or strikes, Barry would have you three, two before you knew it, which is why he walked so many times, but he had an incredible eyesight could pick up the spin of the ball. Like no one else. He had a quick bat at the plate. I mean, he w- he was unbelievable. No matter what anyone says about what about Barry Bonds, I mean, he was just an incredible hitter. Right-handed hitter Edgar Martinez. He's in the Hall of Fame. Paul Molitor. I mean, these guys, man, were just a uh, Chipper Jones from Atlanta. I couldn't get him out. Ricky Henderson. I had a hard time getting him out. I was glad when we were teammates together because I didn't have to get him out. Uh, <laughs> but there are so many greats that I got to play against, and and uh, you know, it's funny. I always remember the the times where I gave up the home run or gave up the big hit and, and that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of great stories, a lot of great memories. How closely do you follow baseball today? Well, last year, I got to tell you that, you know, shortened season 60 games or whatever it was because of COVID and, and, you know, and because I guess, you know, being trapped a little bit at home, spending more time at home than normal. I watched more baseball last year than any Matter of fact, I watched more games last year and you could add up all the games I've watched from retirement up until last year. And I watched more games last year combined really? than, than yeah. all of the other years. So I'm a fan of the game. I got a 15 year old son. He loves the game of baseball. Um, you know, so I, I still love to follow the Toronto Blue Jays and kind of, you know, see what's going on there. And, and I think they've got, they've put a pretty good team together again. They're going to be fun to watch, but uh I loved I love to watch guys perform in pressure pressure situations because I still believe there's so much to learn from those situations. No coincidence, I take it, that the uh, book was set in Toronto with uh, with your the, the time you spent there in your career. Yeah, well, you know, it's like it was growing up for me uh, on the field and off the field, and. And, um, you know, it was it was going through that darkness on the inside. And um, but not only that, it's like, you know, on the outside to play on those world championship teams, um, to, to play for that Toronto Blue Jay organization that started with Paul Beeson, Pat Gillick, Cito Gaston as leaders. Uh, it was just an incredible place to grow up in the game. I'm so thankful and grateful that I had an opportunity to play there. But it was also the place where I went through my transition. So I thought it was important to place the book back in that transition period. Todd, last question I've got for you. We ask everybody uh, this, this season of the in chamber. I feel like you've given a 30 minute answer to this already, but I'm going to ask it at the end of the day, what makes a great day for Todd Stottlemyre? I, I would say a day where, you know, I get up and take the day on a day where I uh, a day where I fail and learn and 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 a day where I have an opportunity to, that no matter what happens, that I get down to the core of myself in the present moment and take time to be grateful that I even got a chance to live that day out. Great. Any any other final thoughts for the listeners today? Uh, again, thanks so much for your time spent with us. Yeah, I would just say, you know, to all the listeners, you know, one of the things I I always say is the impossible just hasn't been done yet. It doesn't really truly mean it's impossible. And I believe that every single one of us uh, was born with a championship seed inside of us. And everyone has different gifts and different talents. Uh, Figure out what your gifts and talents are. Explore them, pursue them, and, and light your life on fire. Well, Todd Stottlemyre, thanks so much. Uh, Personally, I enjoyed watching you during your baseball career, but I've learned so much more reading your book and and listening to you today. Thanks for sharing your story and your messages with our audience. Tom, I appreciate it. Once again, humbled and honored. Uh, uh, I'm grateful uh, for you to give me the platform to, to have the opportunity to share today. So thank you, sir. Excellent. Two quick reminders before we go to major chamber events that you can take advantage of in the next few weeks. The uh, Safety and Health Conference, uh, all virtual, March 1st through 3rd on the largest safety events in the Midwest. Go to indianachamber.com for details. Then our Chamber Day dinner on March 16th, also virtual. Keynote speaker will be Myra Selby, the first woman and the first African-American to be an associate justice on the Indiana Supreme Court. And you will hear her messages on on, uh, on gender and, and, and diversity and inclusion. So again, a powerful program coming up on March 16th. We thank you as always for listening to the In Chamber. We'll be back with our next episode in two weeks. 